Have you ever wondered how companies enter international markets or why localization is important? I'm super excited to introduce to you today's guest. She has worked with Google, LinkedIn, SurveyMonkey, and helped numerous brands uh, enter international markets. She's also a professor of design thinking and marketing strategy, and she is the co-founder of Global Sake, which is how we met, a collective community of cross-functional global leaders driving international expansion. So without further ado, welcome Talia Baruch. Thank you again for meeting with me. Like I read so much about your background and I was just, you know, I'm so impressed and you have so much experience and like you're such a wealth of knowledge. And I can watch some of the YouTube like videos, you know, where you've been speaking at conferences and things. And I was like, okay, I have to meet with her. I have to talk with you. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us just a little bit about your background and how you got into, you know, localization and um, helping brands grow internationally. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me, um, and uh, I love MLC. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I entered the localization industry uh, pretty much at its inception about 23, 24 years ago, and it did come from content. So I studied applied linguistics and uh, French English, and, um, and at, at the early in my career, I was actually doing trans adaptation of uh, literary content of, of Broadway shows and poetry. And um, was always fascinated about um, recreating, you know, trans creating and trans adapting uh, content to, to resonate with the local audiences. So like I remember my first um, uh, off Broadway show was, um, was called Time Out and it was uh, set in uh, New York, New York City and I needed to adapt it actually to Tel Aviv, you know, which is a very complete, completely different ecosystem. And it's of course, you know, a, a, there's a beach. So now we have the beach scene and uh, which is very different from, from the New York uh, setting. So all those dif different um, uh, regional and cultural nuance uh, have always fascinated me from, from younghood. Um, and then I continued and I worked as a localization manager on the vendor side for a decade and then pivoted to the client side and to product and growth. So from adapting content, um, I moved to adapting product experience and performance to fit the, the local markets and to maximize the adoption in, in those uh, priority new markets. Cool. And so you started in kind of the more like literary realm and you and and then you ended up, how did you kind of... Um, pivot to working in tech? Like, was that a hard change, you know? Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, it was very much focused on content and literary uh, and that that sat very well with marketing creative copy. So that's that my entry into the tech industry was through the marketing uh, creative uh, aspect um, and really through the localization. I mean, we, I'm, I'm from Israel. We relocated my family uh, to, San Diego uh, 23 years ago and um, and uh, my first job there was a localization manager. I didn't even know what localization is, but it had to do with languages and uh, and cultures. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that, that seems right. And uh, that's that's how I entered localization. Very cool. Um, and I'm just curious also, what made you move from Tel Aviv to mm -hmm. the US? Uh, my husband is a scientist, so we came for his postdoc in San Diego, and then he did a second postdoc in SF, so we moved here, and and it was only going to be for two years, um, you know, three kids later, and 23 years later, we were still here. Wow, that's so cool. Um, and I was reading, like, in your bio about how you worked with different brands to, you know, manage the international expansion, and one of the ones I noticed was Starbucks going into Middle East. Can you talk about that? Because I used to live in Dubai. So, oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was many years ago, maybe like 20 years ago, Starbucks was a client and um, I worked closely with their, um, so at the time they needed, um, the, the project was, um, they entered seven new Arab countries and they needed to adapt their other training material. So a lot of it was internal content. Um, and, um, you know, just like Spanish for, you know, global Spanish, right, or neutral Spanish. There's no such thing, right? But a lot of companies go with, it's Argentina, kind of, and then strip off the, the local nuance and make it sort of, a, you know, Latin America, neutral Spanish flavor, um, which, which again, you know, every, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know, like every country, every speaking, Spanish speaking countries has a very different cultural nuance and the, the language is, is quite, uh, the, there's a, a lot of language nuance there. Um, so you can't really call anything neutral, but um, 
uh, but similarly with Arabic, right? So there are a lot of different dialects. And this was, you know, uh, seven uh, Arab countries like Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, um, uh, you know, Saudi, and, and many others. So the the what was very interesting there is, um, well, we first of all, kind of, I worked with the Cairo agency because um, they, there are a lot of spoken dialects in Arabic, but the consensus around written language is uh, Egyptian sort of what dictated that is the um, the Egyptian um, uh, like a modern standard. Yeah, okay. well, yeah, the modern standard exactly. The media and um, and that kind of you know set sort of a, the standard for writing, and so we went with that. And then there was um, a huge hurdle. You know, Starbucks, the core of their brand is the siren, and the siren itself um, it was perceived as a very promiscuous and uh, blasphemous in Arab uh, countries, especially in Saudi at the time. Well, still today, um, and uh, uh, just the notion of a woman, first of all, a, a voice of a woman singing to men, you know, to sailors uh, for shipwreck, you know, everything was wrong about that, right? Um, and of course, at the time, she was uh, bare-breasted and, uh, you know, long hair, so very, very blasphemous. And the linguist I had worked with uh, refused to mention the siren in, in their localization work, and I'm like, you know, this is really part of and parcel of the brand. We cannot omit the siren. This we're, everything is about the siren. Um, and um, at the time I was working with a Starbucks to see if they would, you know, again, global branding was a big thing then and their approach was very much global. And if a certain market doesn't fit that mold of our broad global broad, uh, uh, global brand recognition, then, then they're not a good fit for us, right? That was kind of the mindset at the time. Um, my a lot of my work was to in some cases there is you know sometimes a global brand uh, recognition is necessary and in other cases where you a specific market is important and uh, where it's necessary to adapt you do want to make some adjustments at least in the if not in the uh, brand recognition at least in the messaging and the marketing and the, and the brand positioning messaging uh, but the company at the time was not ready to take that leap and to do a local a local fit. Um, and they simply refused. And, um, you know, um, of course it was, you know, we, we could not, they could not be present in, uh, in Saudi. Um, 19 years later, um, they adapted. Uh, they changed their logo. They basically took, took away the siren. The logo now has uh, the waves and just the crown. Mm -hmm. on the waves. So uh, as, a, as a illustrative implied representation. Uh, yeah, but, you know, sometimes it takes companies a while to, to you know, come to terms with a geofit adaptation. Yeah, I didn't know about that because I, I did know I've been to Saudi and I know like they have that change logo as you mentioned, and then in Mecca they don't even show the lo like they have Starbucks but they don't have the actual logo because in Mecca. Um, yeah. So I didn't know that. So they originally said, okay, we're not going to go into Saudi. Well, they, they were not willing to comply with any regional uh, factors, right? Um, ah. And, the, the, you know, this whole dilemma around global, global versus local, right? And especially when it comes to something so sensitive as your global brand identity, a lot of companies, um, at least 20 years ago, were not very willing to compromise that. Uh, and I think now there's more appetite to consider because brands see that they, it hurts their business bottom line. We did that until when, when I, I headed international products and growth at LinkedIn. When we entered China in 2014, uh, we we cannibalized our brand. You know, we did something outrageous. Like I, I have not never seen any other company willing to go that far. But that that was our entry into China, and LinkedIn is still existent in China as an American social media, which is in itself an amazing achievement. Uh, but at that time, uh, we went in with um, a native local app. You know, it's a mobile first country. So we created a, a native look and feel and 100% made in China um, app uh, for job seekers, again, tied to those regional factors of young cohort, mobile first, you know, because, it, because it's a young age cohort the, of, of professionals and students, so the 17 to, to 26, um, it was a single value prop uh, app uh, designed for job seekers, entry level. And um, we went in and we did not, you know, it, we tied it all, you know, WeChat integration, uh, Sina Web, uh, Tencent, QQ, Sina Weibo, 
all those uh, APIs with the local uh, ecosystem channels. And um, then we didn't, we, we didn't call it LinkedIn, we called it Chitu. And the whole brand around it was tied to Chinese uh, ancient heritage, to the, the horse. Um, Chitu actually means the, the a rabbit, but the, the logo was a horse and it's tied to like a, a heritage. Uh, standalone, lightweight, um, uh, native mobile, na native app. Uh, designed for um, entry-level internship uh, job seekers oh. in the market, um, and it it was it's, it was cheap. It was a LinkedIn product, but we did not position it as a LinkedIn product. We positioned it as a native app, and it was a very successful. And it was a very successful kind of um, insider into China. Uh, later, you now recently, it had this particular app was sunsetted, but. Um, but LinkedIn as, as the, you know, the website, LinkedIn as the, 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 the product itself is existent in China. So, um, so that was, that was a, a success story and this, at the time, and it was very much about like going um, all in on integrating regional and cultural factors into the product strategy and into the go-to-market strategy. Yeah, that's for, and, and how did that kind of decision come about? You know, cause I know you, some companies are reluctant to do all these changes. Some companies seem to like embrace it. Like, oh, we want to like change as much as possible to get in. Like, how do they um, kind of, you know, decide on that, make these decisions? Yeah, it really depends on the um, mindset of the company on the culture and it all drills down from the top, right? So if the C-levels, if the founders, um, lived in other countries, have an international orientation, they get it. They understand that it's, you know, international product, international expansion. It's not just about um, having our international customers understand our, our product um, and, and therefore just uh, translate the finished product and introducing, introducing localization as a tail end production of rendering whatever amazing product features we've built and designed and simply translating in so that others, other communities can understand it, right, in other countries. But they, they understand that it's not just about that. It's really more heavily about our, you know, the, the, what problem we're solving for, um, who it is we're optimizing it for, and how do we define and measure success for our product, and how does that fit our international segments, right? In, in some countries, the, the segmentation, the use cases are different. Certainly the environments are different, the, ecos the, the, the APIs would be different, the strategic partnerships would be different, regulatory compliances, um, oftentimes the value prop positioning, the marketing messaging needs to uh, be adaptive to that, to resonate with that culture, with that um, market needs and gaps. So it's, it's more, you know, really us understanding our international segments in the priority markets. We don't have to do it in every, in every market necessarily, and not every market needs major nuanced um, changes, absolutely not. Um, we do want to provide neutral, you know, global ready, right, um, uh, experiences that can match maximum uh, of, of usability around the world. But in some cases, in some markets, we definitely need to, you know, do our due diligence um, to, in understanding our consumers within the cultural context of their regional environment and to reposition and rethink uh, our value proposition and our product performance to, to be successful, to not just land in the new market, but to actually adopt, to actually maximize the, the maturity uh, penetration in the market. Yeah, and yeah. on the topic of, you know, flexibility and adapting to change and things like that, um, in light of, you know, the pandemic, where we were forced to adapt to a number of changes, um, have you seen, what kind of trends have you seen in localization and globalization? Um, so definitely, you know, AI and uh, neural uh, networks uh, with MT and with other applica multilingual applications um, uh, feeding um, is, is a big uh, uh, game changer. Um, hybrid solutions, right, with post-human edit. A lot of uh, work on relevancy algorithm and, and, and uh, personalization um, that actually works for multilingual, multi-geo uh, performance. So oftentimes, you know, I would say like, even five years ago, um, many US-based co uh, companies would launch international markets. They would be fully localized. Um, 
the UI, the marketing, the, the customer support, customer care, everything would be localized. But, um, but, but the product performance, the product would not work on the same level as it worked in core English markets. So it, you know, search wouldn't work for multilingual, multi-geo, uh, or at least not, be, not optimized as the, there would be, they would not be on par with the US performance, right? So search wouldn't work, um, the relevant, the recommendation systems, the relevancy algo would not work. Still today, if, if, you, if you type, even on your iPhone, right? If you type, you know how the autofiller, right? Um, uh, uh, segment sentence completion, um, which is obviously AI, uh, AI enhanced, um, it does not work in every language, right? Or if you type in a word and you expect to, um, the phone to suggest the, the, the icon, the logo, to go with, it would do that for in English. It wouldn't do that in Hebrew when I type, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. so, so the product, of, a lot of people don't realize that even though the product is translated and localized, it's not functional in many features uh, in other languages in other countries. Um, so that's where AI-enhanced technology can really um, start um, filling out the, the gap at scale in the tech debt. And that's, I would say, is a big uh, player uh, in, in today's era. And I think that will accelerate now that trained models are becoming uh, more sophisticated and we can see, you know, better results uh, for multilingual performance. So this is one, one element that is a, a game changer. Another one is um, I'm starting to see a mind shift in, you know, I've, I've been preaching all my life for 20 years for global readiness and geofit in content and in product experience, um, it, it took time. It took time to, to resonate, to sit with, 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 with the executives, you know? Um, and I'm starting to see now um, more willingness, more, more, more openness into an adaptive strategy. So um, a lot of companies are set up in a global standard mindset and that feeds into their entire cross-functional strategy and org structure. Uh, what I'm talking about is um, global readiness, which is very different, you know, in, in process, you know, in, in the org structure, in the, in the company processes, you know, moving away from linear to more circular um, launch cycles. English is just one of the languages we support, right? Having a more global ready mindset, um, you know, if we are targeting uh, Japan, maybe we want to create content specifically for Japan and maybe we adapt that or even a feature for Japan and we adapt that to um, to, to Germany because the, we have the same use case uh, scenario for customer segmentation there, right? So having a much more circular and a more uh, holistic and a more very much a very cross-functional uh, mindset and, and strategic approach to how we run our business and uh, how we develop and design our products um, is, is a new concept that I've been driving, you know, all, all my career here. Um, and I'm starting to say, and, you know, Global Sake, the venture I've started uh, back in 2017, is very much about that. It's very much about that, um, you know, bringing localization to a very different discussion. It's not just a, a tail end production, but really um, seeing it as a, as a strategic uh, cross functional effort in the org and its influence on, um, on, on the business bottom line and how we think about new markets expansion. Yeah, I wanted to like go into that topic because that's how we met, you know, through Global yeah. Sake, through Multilingual Connections as a member of Global Sake. So can you tell us kind of some more about, um, yeah, like what, you know, who's involved and what kind of like led you to create it to, uh, as a founder and, you know, just kind of some background on that. Yeah, so, um, you know, I've worked in the industry um, for, for many years and then in 2017, um, I left, my, my last uh, role was heading international product and growth at ServerMonkey. And in 2017, I left uh, to, to start something new. And um, I realized at that point that, you know, in my career, I've always evan internally evangelized, right? And internally um, moved, you know, shifted uh, processes and mindsets. And, and, and you know, I had to align my international OKRs with all the other stakeholder leaders, uh, lead OKRs across the company. And so slowly kind of shifting and changing the mindset within the companies. But, um, but I realized that this was a very common problem, especially for US-based companies. And I wanted to do something that's more impactful. And so I realized that actually no one teaches, I, I have not seen a university that actually teaches international products. Um, 
you know, MIS teaches, uh, Middlebury Institute of International Studies teaches uh, localization, uh, other universities teach international business, um, but international product per se, like how do you create PRDs and how do you, um, you know, how do you uh, build products and, and prototype and think of the, you know, product concept proof and, and then, and, but think about all of those things, all of these uh, development processes with the mindset of, you know, who's going to use it? Like, how is, uh, you know, a user in Indonesia, go, you know, how, how is it relevant for someone in Indonesia versus for someone in Mexico, right? Kind of thinking of all those scenarios uh, planned, intended for that product performance and building that into the value prop uh, and into the back end and mid tier. At the, at, the, at, the fourth, at, the, at the inception, right? Because that's how companies can really hit the ground running with the uh, new markets expansion. So I, I created a curriculum to teach that and uh, started teaching that at um, three different universities. It's, it was part of the um, executive MBA program uh, here at SF State University, at the Holt International Business School and uh, at SEDIM, which is a design grad school in uh, Mexico City and in Monterrey in Mexico. Cool. Um, all my students are worldwide. They all come from, you know, from a lot of them from actually Saudi and the UAE. Oh, wow. Yeah, but, uh, but of course, Asia, of course, Asia, Europe. And um, so uh, it landed on very, uh, you know, understanding and receiving ears. And, and, and basically, Global Sake is the corporate education. For me, it's like the corporate education uh, piece. So um, in 2021, we had to go uh, fully virtual with the pandemic. And so I basically took my curriculum and split it into 12 monthly modules, each of them focused on a specific function in the company. So, um, you know, payments, and then how do we treat that international component? So payments, we had glo global payments and brought in, you know, speakers from Nubank, you know, a, a, a mobile first, a mobile only um, app for the underbanked and, uh, you know, in, in Brazil and their international story into Colombia and Mexico versus PayPal's, you know, US outbound and their partnership with Flutterwave based in Nigeria to enable mobile payments across the 50 countries of Africa and so on. So bringing the multi multitude of perspectives um, you know, another event was focused on user research for international segments and on international UI UX and so on. Each, each month was dedicated to a different function. Um, we had amazing uh, growth uh, last year. So my partner, I, um, uh, John Hayato, um, and I um, run uh, these, um, these monthly events uh, in 2021 and really expanded exponentially the, our communities um, because it was virtual, it was much more inclusive. And we now have um, had over 700 uh, registered um, participants coming from across Africa and, and Asia and Europe and the Americas. Uh, and Nina, of course. Um, and uh, this year we just launched the 2022 program. So the first event is gonna be on uh, March 3rd. And, I'll be there. Uh, fantastic. So yeah, last year was focused on the cross-functional alignment. And um, again, our target audience, the, the, the members, the parliament members who are the annual subscribers um, are very much, you know, some of them are the localization managers, but a lot of them are the VP of product and the director of marketing. So the cross-functional leads, um, which is exactly the people we want to invite um, to the table to discuss uh, uh, global readiness and, and uh, international expansion. And then this year is more focused on, on deepening the relationship building. So, um, and, and the knowledge share uh, between all these, uh, you know, complementing skill sets that we have represented. Very cool. And can you tell us what, um, I mean, it's a great program. I mean, I, I'm still new to Global Sakai, but I love it so far. Um, can you talk a little bit about like, what's kind of, you know, your vision for the future of Global Sake? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my vision for it is that, um, you know, we're, it's, it's the human factor, right? It's, we, it's the, the people, the people who participate, the speakers, the thought leaders, the, 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 the parliament members. Um, this is a very savvy cohort of uh, global leaders. Uh, all of them, through different functions, all of them are uh, driving international growth. So that's the common denominator. 
um, but people are serving in many different ways. Um, and you know, I, I'm a true believer that when you bring people across across skill sets, across functions and cultures and countries, you know, which is different perspectives and mindsets, when you bring them together, uh, that's when you can really solve problems. That's where innovation happens. Um, and so for me, Global Sake, like the, 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 the end vision is building those assets. So having, you know, uh, more people coming from more um, different, you know, startups and scale-ups and multinational companies and um, different countries and different verticals um, and their different uh, skill set expertise, subject matter expertise, um, increasing basically those those footprints, right? Those footprints and and with that presenting content, we're focused not just on presenting content. There's a lot of content out there on the you know available, readily accessible and available, right? It's we're bringing very different content, uh, right? Talking about international product um, and, and go to market strategy from a much more cross functional and holistic uh, mindset, um, very rounded views uh, and, and practical case study applied learnings. But in addition to the content, a lot of the focus at Global Sake is on relationship building because you know, that's when people, again, can you know, complement their skill sets and, and really uh, collaborate to solve real problems in a much more efficient way. And also to, to have fun. So um, the culture, um, in every event we have, we're bringing, uh, even in the virtual events, we had uh, live concerts, um, bringing kind of that cross-cultural experience. Uh, and then this year, um, we're doing a lot of in-person. So there'll be the four quarterly virtual events, but then There'll be an in-person, uh, a physical party in San Francisco, and uh, we're doing lock walks. So I'm starting a lock walk uh, this Friday, actually, in San Francisco. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, it's like an um, international picnic. I'm bringing a Medi Mediterranean spread, um, and we're doing a, a walk with industry folks. I have folks coming from Netflix and, and uh, Airbnb and uh, Slack and uh, you know, Meta and LinkedIn. Others um, and we just you know everyone today is isolated in their screen and um, I, I think very eager to be outdoors to move their bodies. Agreed. To, uh, wait for yeah. and speak with like-minded people from from the industry and learn and, and just have fun. And enjoy. And Definitely. <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah, and I'll include the links and all the information so people um, on the video so they can um, you know read more about it and join and things like that. Um, so. Uh, I have a few quick questions, a few last questions. So just, um, and these are questions like, just tell me like the first thing that like comes to your mind. Okay. So um, what motivates you? Uh, connection. Love it. Uh, what does, does the world, <laughs> what? Does it have to be one word? <laughs> um, you can say more than one word. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, meaning, meaningful connection. connection. <laughs> meaningful, I love that. Okay, cool. Um, what does the world need more of? Hmm. Yeah, uh, human. Remembering kindness, kindness, and and the human spirit. I, I'm with you there. What is one thing you would like people or companies to know about localization? Um, that it's not just the job of uh, the linguist or the the localization team. That it's everybody's job. Uh, that we are building products uh, for people across the planet, and um, that concerns every person, every member of the company. Favorite success story for a, a globalized brand? Hmm. I mean, companies that have really done well that, you know, user research and market research and that due diligence um, and, and of understanding their international customers within their, within their country ecosystem um, are Procter & Gamble or, Net, or um, you know, um, uh, Nike uh, in terms of their brand marketing uh, have really gone a long way in investment, investing in understanding their se their international segments and, and uh, investing in, um, in product and marketing. Um, there are many, many, many amazing stories. Uh, I mean, do we have time to share stories? <laughs> if you want to share, of course, I mean, if you want to share one, I would love to hear it. I, I like to share that, you know, at, um, at Server Monkey, um, I my, my team, we, we, I sat in growth, in the growth team. And so uh, we were doing, I, I personally was doing a lot of A-B testing. So we own the A-B testing platform and all the top of funnel code base. 
so that was a playground for me and so I um, I did a lot of testing at the time I was focusing on Germany and UK so this is like two years before GDPR and knowing that uh, you know uh, German consumers are much more concerned with trust and privacy data privacy um, and transparency um, I tested something that again I would never test in the US it would cannibalize it would uh, you know create friction in our new signups it would kill my metrics but I did test it in, in Germany and it was um, in, in sign up page introducing before the sign up free CTA introducing two explicit uh, check boxes that are opt-in right they have to check them in order to make the sign up uh, button clickable right and those two um, check boxes, uh, like the first one had three unique links, taking them to three very clear um, single pages in German, in German, telling them exactly how we're going to collect, use, and share their data, right? And this is, you know, in order to sign up, they need to consent to that. And, and it's, it's, I basically made it very accessible and transparent. We didn't change anything in the back end. We still used, collected, share, you know, uh, collected, used, and shared their data um, uh, at the time, again, before GDPR restrictions. Um, but we just made it very clear and transparent. I would never do it in the US. It would kill us. But in Germany, not only did it not introduce friction, I had a 10% incremental lift in new signups oh. from this treatment. And then those who were in that funnel, uh, in that treatment, um, uh, you know, for ServerMonkey, the biggest lever for, um, for conversion to paid is the deploy of a survey, right? Most people take a survey, but to deploy a survey, that's the highest core engagement. Mm -hmm. And really the second deploy is that cliff to conversion to paid uh, metric. So, um, so for me, like, you know, growth success is not sign up because that's easy to make people, you know, click that button, but it's really retention, right? How many people actually convert to paid and actually then retain? Um, and so with, with those folks uh, going through you know, that 10% incremental lift, those people actually, from, out of them, 24% of them uh, deployed their first survey. So a 20, sorry, it was a 24% lift in, new, in first survey deploy, wow. which is huge. It's exactly the, the, the quality signup we want, the engaged new signups. And out of them, 70, I don't remember, like 75 or 76% of them converted to paid, for new paid, you know? So that was, uh, I mean, um, I've done a lot of A-B testing, but that particular test uh, for me was kind of the ultimate proof that it's not one size fits all and uh, the expected behavior of people in different countries is, is different. And you can really, um, you know, maximize your, your metrics. You know, a lot of companies, um, they, they look at metrics, they, 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 they look at like US Canada metrics and then international metrics, right? They bulk all the- Yeah, just like put all in one. Yes, but then they get the wrong insights. You know, I, I, one of my recent clients, can't disclose their name, but, they, but it's a two-sided marketplace. And um, the, the pros, the service providers, um, you know, they, they basically saw that seven, overall in this, um, in this uh, metric uh, split of, US Canada versus international, uh, they saw that 70% of the revenues generated from US Canada um, and that dictated, that KP, that metric basically dictated their MVP, their priority initiatives, which is to invest more in US Canada. But actually when you do the in-country metrics, then we see, you know, I was kind of poking in there and doing in-country metrics. And then I saw that actually um, U.S. Canada, you know, only 1.5 percent of their total pros, pro, pro, pro you know, service providers, are were paid pro pros. Whereas, if you do country split um, in uh, in France, in Germany, and in uh, Japan, uh, that number was actually double, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see, you can start seeing um, traction and um, and market potential, right? When you start digging into in-country data, uh, data splits. Uh, and that gives you very different insight on what you should prioritize for and in, in, in the potential for in investment. So, so anyway, th this is why I love to do A-B testing because you know, that's kind of, it's a, it's a proof of, uh, it's a proof of concept, right? Uh, Cause you can 
theoretically talk about integrating cultural regional no you know nuance into your strategy mm -hmm. you actually show how the, what that translates into is hard to convince. Very cool. Thank you so much. Um, last question. So since I know you're multi, you speak um, Hebrew, English, and French. And French. So um, last question. What's your favorite word in your, oh. in, I guess, in, you can say your native language. Hmm. Um, I would say, wow, well, uh, that's a hard one. <laughs> Um, my, my, my first thought was Beteavon. Beteavon, uh, it's kind of, Beteavon in Hebrew, you know, it's, it's a gap word. It's a word that, there's no translation for that in English. Um, it's bon appétit. Um, yeah. But it's also, for me, it re re represents, you know, something different than that because um, it's, it means, you know, that you actually, you know, having appetite for life, <laughs> you know, um, Beteavon. Uh, I mean, you say it in Hebrew, like- What is it, Beteavon? Beteavon, Beteavon. Is it one, is it two words or one? One word. Beteavon. 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 Yes. <laughs> and it means like an appetite for life. And wait, what's an example when you would say it? Oh, it, it literally means uh, bon appétit, you know, enjoy oh, your food. Like yes. when you give the food. Yes, that's right. But but it but it could mean. I mean, for me, like I, I love this word first of all because it's a gap word in in English and in some other languages um, that don't have that exact uh, word. Uh, like in English, you would say enjoy, right? But it's not really. Yeah, the enjoy. Bar. Yeah, yeah. We don't have a. It's like very specific, right? Uh, I love words that have. You know, I just learned today that actually the word love, like in Greek, in Greek and Turkish, they have six different words for love. Right, depending on what you what it is, you know, love for God, love for a friend, you know, uh, sexual uh, love, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, love for a child, right? And and, and uh, these are the, the kind of words I love the most, where um, it, there are gaps, they they don't exist in every language, and you can kind of see, okay, well, they they thought a little bit more about that, you know, but that nuance there, right? Um, and so that for me kind of touches on that cultural nuance, which is which I'm fascinated by. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for having me.